give God praise, shall we, everybody? What a sweet time of praising the Lord together. Thank you. Let's say thank you to our musicians, Zeke and all the team. Thank you, guys. Awesome job. Yeah. Uh, please turn to the scriptures, to Psalm 43, as I have a good look at you all and say good morning. And I'm thrilled because it's still July and uh, there's some people in the house, amen. And hasn't God been good to our church, everybody? I uh, just praise God for what he's done through us. And we've been through a lot together and the spiritual maturity that's come in this place has been one of the sweetest things to, to see in my time as a pastor. And I just wanna say I love you all. It's great to be away for a week, but it's even better to be back as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to what God's gonna do in August in this place. I think we need a few more chairs being put out, amen. And uh, we, cause we got a lot of people to invite, a lot of people to reach in this community that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people that know about God and maybe have walked with the Lord, but they need some discipling and so we got, I'll share some things about how we can uh, encourage one another on the way. Hey, we're starting a, a new series in two weeks' time uh, called Toxic, How to Deal with Toxic People in Your Life. I think we've got a slide to, to come up as well, so you'll see that the, the slide. Can we put it on the screen? Thank you. We'll see that appearing kind of uh, in, in our media the next um, uh, couple of weeks or so. And uh, when I've mentioned this a couple of times, there's been like a little intake of breath a couple of times because if I were to ask you, are you dealing with any toxic folks in your life? Most people are gonna go like, they start nodding straight back. Now, you gotta be careful how you invite people uh, to this series because you can't really say, um, um, hey, pastor's talking about toxic people and I was thinking that you might like to come along. You know, you gotta, you know, gotta be wise about that one. But if you ask somebody, seriously, try this at work or at school, whatever, just say, hey, do you know like someone and they're like a little toxic in your life, you're struggling to deal with that. I'm, I'm telling you, people are gonna nod and say yes. And so please pray for me, pray for us as we look at some incredible stories, especially from the life of David, how David was able to deal with toxicity. And the thing about talking about it, you have gotta talk about it with great humility because there's that part of us that needs cleansing and washing clean and God wants to deal with us and I believe he will deal with us also along the way as well. So that's something to invite people to. Next week's like promotion Sunday, big Sunday for us as a church. We're gonna have the Lord's Supper together as well. It's all part of our uh, worshiping uh, time together. We've got a special prayer night, August the 15th and I want to call your attention to that. These new prayer nights that we've been doing have been drawing some really encouraging crowds and the other day, it, the last prayer time is just like the start of the summer Thunder was, a, a huge storm rolled into the community. We're at the North Campus. I'm thinking, no one's gonna come tonight. Uh, we had trouble with the electricity. I thought, no one's gonna show up. We still had 90 people come along for that prayer night. Zeke led the worship with his family. It was really incredible. The next one's gonna be at Northgate. And so it's for the whole church to go to Northgate uh, High School and I just want to encourage you to do that. Now, I know you've got a lot of important stuff to do, you know, like, um, you know, looking at turtle, turtle reels, turtles eating strawberries and things, you know, the kind of things that people do for a couple of hours today. I know you've got to, to, to spend at least a couple of hours looking at some of that meaningless stuff along the way. And I know you're all very, very busy. Just kidding you there. But uh, so, so apparently someone told me there's something about tur people watching turtles eating strawberries. I better get back to the Bible as soon as I can. Uh, but but uh, I know you've got a lot on. But you know something? When God's people gather together for prayer, I believe that's made a difference for us in recent months. You know, we've baptized those 60 odd folks in that 60-day in that, uh, run. We've got some more baptisms coming up, I believe, uh, this morning as well. Let's give God praise for those who are being baptized. We're excited about that. So um, we want to be prayed up. We want to start this new season. We're relaunch we've had Wednesday nights going for a year, but we want to relaunch it in a new way. We've got special theme. Alice is going to tell you all about that. We've got some themed dinners and everything. So, and especially, we want to teach and train this next generation to face all the crazy stuff that's going on around us. We want this to be a great training ground. In fact, I can't think of a better um, history our church has had on our Wednesday night live classes. Just incredible array of things that you can get into to learn about how you can grow in the faith. And so we wanted to do Bible studies. We want to get our worship on. We want to get a prayer on. But I heard um, a pastor friend of mine called Bruce uh, Frank. He's at Biltmore Baptist Church, similar church to New Hope. And uh, they sometimes do sort of outtakes of his, of his preaching. His media team do an incredible job. And uh, he was talking the other day about, you know how you go to the gym like, like Zeke does? And you, that was so sweet of you to give him a little bit of banter this morning. I enjoyed that. Um, well done. But uh, keep it up. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you see some of those guys and they've, they've got the, the arms, they've got the shoulders, they've got the back, they've got the, the big chest going on and everything. It's like, but you can tell they skip leg day. <laughs> and... 
And Bruce is saying, you know, we love to do our Bible studies and we want to encourage that. We start the day with the Lord. We do our Bible studies. Uh, we want to get our worship on. We want to praise Him. We, got, you know, we lift our hands in praise. We want to worship Him and everything. But leg day is often service. And a lot of Christians skip leg day. Uh, and we want you to do another Bible study, but it's like Wednesday is an incredible opportunity to pour into the next generation. So are Sundays. And I just want to encourage you to make sure you're making a difference in your service. We do a class called Who Me. That's something we've been teaching for years and years, a class I wrote about uh, 25 years ago and uh, turn it into a book and everything. But that's really a heartbeat for our church that God has equipped every single one of us to be useful in his service. And, and by the way, my ministry, to say my ministry is an oxymoron. Your ministry is not your ministry. Your ministry belongs to the Lord and it belongs to the body of Christ. My gifts don't belong to me. My gifts belong to the Lord and they belong to the body of Christ, amen? And so we've got a responsibility to make sure that we're fulfilling the mission as to why God has called us to be in this place. So I look around this magnificent place today. I'm so, so uh, thrilled with what God is doing and I just wonder what God wants to do with us. I don't think he just wants to add a few people uh, and to fill in just like these few extra seats that are missing this morning. I think he wants to do something far beyond we can even ask or imagine. My dream is revival. If I were to summarize my ministry in one word and what, what, what my heartbeat would be, and that is for a national awakening, for New Hope to make a difference in our community, in our nation, who knows what God is going to do. But I'm telling you, if we avail ourselves to him, God will do great things in, in this place. Can we give him praise, everybody? Give him praise. Um, Psalm 43, let's read the word together. Uh, th these were unhealthy times in the life of Israel. You're going to see the background is quite stunning, that the opening lines are quite stunning. But I believe that God will give us an opportunity here to see in this psalm that we can still be healthy, we can still be spiritually joyful, even when everything is crazy around us. And I believe that would be the testimony of this church so here we go, Psalm 43, verse 1. Notice the kind of shocking start. Vindicate me. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me for those who are deceitful and wicked. You can see the problem. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? And now we move into the solution. Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the lyre. That means the electric guitar, just in case you didn't know that. I'll praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Next week, by the way, will be the last week in our series on the Psalms. We've been in the Psalms for most of this year, and then, of course, we'll be starting the new series. But uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach on this word today. You know, Psalms are about worship. They are God-centered truth. And notice the phrase in that first verse, my God. That's a phrase that we hear a lot in our culture. And I think there are three ways that it's said. First of all, it's kind of in a, in a sort of holy moly kind of way, something that just spills out of people's lives. That can easily go into that second way of saying my God, and that is blasphemy, that we've taken the Lord's name in vain. But in this context, it's quite different to that. This is a deep spiritual intercession calling out to the God who we need more than any other. Uh, this is the latter, my God. And so it's okay for Christian to declare my God, but make sure you say it in the right way, amen? We want to bring honor and glory to his name. So what's the life story behind the psalm? We've been trying to gauge the story behind the psalm each time, and sometimes at the top, that little title that you have in many of the psalms describes the situation. Well, there's no uh, description here. You'll notice there's just nothing at all there. It may well be a psalm of the sons of Korah. John Avant preached on Psalm 42, which is listed as that. And there's repetition in Psalm 43, like the chorus 
used in Psalm 42, is used again in Psalm 43, so it could have been the same authors. Spurgeon believes that David was the main editor of all the Psalms, so I may find myself at some stage saying David because I see David in just about all of the Psalms as well, and you can see his life in these stories as well. But notice again the dramatic beginning. Should we just repeat it? Vindicate me, my God. Plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. Here the singer is surrounded by a disobedient nation. He's wanting to be a man of God. He's wanting to sing God's praises. And he's trying to praise God even though there are problems pulling against him. And it's a strange beginning as well because he's, he's kind of um, bringing a legal appeal to God to say, I need your vindication, which mean, means I need to be cleared of blame. Because the world's laying it on me, and it's a heavy burden to, to bear, so he cries out to God for vindication. Uh, I want us to think about that as a consistent sort of Bible story again and again. Uh, the Bible shows us a godly man or a godly woman surrounded by an ungodly culture with deceitful opinion leaders who, appeal to, who appear to rule the day and want to ruin the life of the believer. That just seems to be a common theme, and sometimes we feel that in our culture as well. Uh, Daniel, when you think about him, was one of the great leaders taken into captivity, stripped of his name and his freedom and his homeland. He lived his life as a stranger in a strange land, and yet he didn't feel sorry for himself. God continued to use him in that godless culture. He ends up becoming basically the prime minister over four different changes of regime in one of the most dramatic and significant eras in history, so much so that God gives him visions about how this is unworking in the whole big scheme of the ultimate return of Christ. Daniel literally interpreted the writing on the wall. Uh, he's the only one that's ever done that. And what a remarkable person he was. Later, he's thrown into the lion's den because shock, horror, he dares to pray when it becomes illegal to pray. Amen. The same book of Daniel has those three friends. Do you remember their name? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they refuse to bow down to the big idol. You think about what those idols are today. It's pretty obvious. You could come up with that list pretty quickly. And I tell you what, the culture will condemn you pretty quickly if you refuse to bow down to that idol. You'll be shamed You'll be canceled. So what do you do, Daniel? What do you do, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you know it's the same story with Queen Esther before the emperor? She stands up for truth. She prays, and she says, if I perish, I perish. Jesus, betrayed by Judas, then before the high priest and Pilate, crucify him. I love Stephen, don't you, everyone? He's one of the sweetest men in Scripture. He's before the mob, delivering a magnificent treatise of truth and the only reply that the world will give to him is to put their hands over their mouth and to throw hands over their ears. They don't want to hear what he has to say. They shout at him and they throw stones his way. Doesn't that sound familiar these days? It seems to be that the strategy of the world is put your hands over the ears, disengage the rational mind, shout the slogan, shame those who disagree with the trendy propaganda, however absurd it may be. But I'm telling you, friends, this biblical cloud of witness in Scripture remind us of the victory. Because the lions did not get Daniel. And the fiery furnace did not even singe a thread from the clothes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Lord was in the fire with them. David was delivered. Why? Because the battle is the Lord's. And Esther was saved and all her people were saved. And it reminds us we should always pray when we're in trouble. And Stephen dies, but not without seeing Jesus first at the right hand of the Father. And it may have seemed the worst thing of all that our Savior was crucified. I'm telling you, if you were there when they crucified our Lord, we should tremble. When we even consider what it was for the evil that was done to the sinless Son of God, we should tremble and be horrified that our son, uh, the precious Son of God was crucified for us. But isn't it also the greatest thing that God ever did? That my sins were placed upon his shoulders and that three days later, Jesus Christ rose again. Can we give God praise, everybody? Can we give him praise? <clears throat> You see, Psalm 43 stands in this cloud of witnesses as a song of victory for the righteous and a defeat for the godless. And I want to, want to declare our God is awesome, and he never lost a battle. 
And so it's an almost shocking beginning, plead my cause, literally judge me, are the opening lines of the song. God, I stand under judgment in the eyes of a sinful world. The world hates me. The world condemns me. They're trying to destroy me. They're deceitful. They're picking at me. They hate me. And so, Lord, I'm looking to the only one who can save me, and that's why I declare, vindicate me, O God. So this is the context. And I want to say that there, there are two vindications. It's that deep desire in us for, for it not all to be laid upon us. There are two types of vindication. First of all, there's been vindicated in the eyes of men. And every one of us understands what unjust accusation is like. Everyone understands the pain of what that person did and how we feel about that. And here's the thing about vindication before man. We kind of tend to get disappointed by that one. Because rarely do they come back and say, I should never have left. I should, sometimes this will happen. I should never have treated you that way. You know, it's a pretty rare thing. And when someone does that, it's only because the Lord has taken hold of them and convicted them and he's done a work in their hearts and they've come to us. And I hope that we are always good at receiving something like that and saying, hey, we're good. I need forgiveness too. Uh, let's be friends. Let's be brothers. Let's be, be sisters. But that vindication in the eyes of men, would you agree with me? It's a pretty rare thing. And I think if you spend all your time worrying about being vindicated in the eyes of man, you're going to be disappointed. There has to be something deeper going on in the heart of the believer that takes us beyond what could end up becoming a sort of pettiness. Well, she said that to me, and he said that, and you end up kind of developing all these bitternesses. We'll talk about this in Toxic, all right, in, in, in that series. But that's the first kind of indication, and that's there in the psalmist. It's personally painful for the psalmist, whether it's a group of singers or whether it's David himself. Uh, but it, that's a hard thing. But the most important kind of vindication is to be vindicated in the eyes of God. I think we spend way too long worrying about vindication in the eyes of men and trying to justify ourselves and say, well, this is what I was really trying to do and you didn't understand me. And I, I know we need to do some of that talking with each other from time to time, but we spend way too long on that and not enough on being vindicated in the eyes of God. We need to make sure that we're right with God, amen. And here's the, here's the problem with vindication. You cannot vindicate yourself. However much the psalmist tries to go, Lord, um, uh, I'm a pretty good guy. I don't deserve this. And sometimes the psalms can read like that a lot. And there are some psalms that sort of said, I haven't done anything wrong. I've even read psalms of David quite recently this week. And David's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And you're going like, well, hold on. How about um, Bathsheba? <laughs> and you start to go through the list. And you know that whenever we get to the point of going like, I don't even deserve this, we probably need to stop it and understand where do we get our vindication. To be vindicated is to no longer have the blame laid on, upon us. Where do we get our vindication? Would you agree with me that there is one place that we find that, and that is through the cross of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I once had the privilege when I was a, a young kid, I was 15 years old, new Christian, and I interviewed someone called Roy Castle, who was like the most famous children's celebrity in the nation. He, he did this thing on the Guinness Book of Records called the Record Breakers, and he broke all kinds of world records himself. And he was known that we didn't have many Christian celebrities in those days, but we went along to this local theater. A friend of mine, had put, put, his dad had put this event on, and I got to interview Roy Castle, and we played it before the church. And I asked him what it meant for him to be a follower of Jesus, and this is what he said. And so he's in the entertainment business. You know what that's like. Uh, he's with the Lord now, and uh, he just said, you know, at the end of my day, I can look in the mirror and know because of Jesus, I have nothing to be ashamed of. Isn't that a sweet place to be? If you really believe that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, you, you don't have to worry about being vindicated in the eyes of, of men. I'll say it again, stop it. Focus on your relationship with God, and when you see yourself before the Lord, and when you ask the Lord, what do you think of me? In fact, even ask the Holy Spirit from time to time, Lord, what do you think of me? And sometimes we have, start to have a very bad day, don't we? Because <laughs> we start to see ourselves before the Lord. Whatever we have in our lives, the beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ is that his blood washes me clean as far as the east is from the west, so my sins have been washed away. And I found myself praying while we were away through John 16. And essentially, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin and, and convince us of Jesus. And so I found myself praying, Lord, convict this nation of sin. And there's a lot of it, Lord. Convict this nation of sin and convince this nation 
of the truth of Jesus Christ. That probably is the greatest need in our land right now to stop sinning, to stop complaining, to stop vindicating ourselves, to start arguing our, stop arguing our cause and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Convict me of sin and convince me of Jesus Christ. We don't just pray that for the nation. We pray it for ourselves. Would you even pray that with me right now? Just repeat after me. Convict me of sin. And I want to put, you don't have to repeat this bit, but when we say that, we're really saying, um, I recognize my sinfulness before you. I'm a sinner. Convict me of sin. Okay, next thing, say, convince me of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can vindicate us and put us right with a holy God. And if you're thankful for that, will you give him praise, everybody? Can we praise his name? So let's look back at verse 1 again. Vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. This is the context of praise. So you and I can still praise the Lord even when there's an unfaithful nation and even when there's godlessness and even wickedness and deceitfulness. And that's a hard thing to deal with because when someone is against you, they don't care about the truth. When someone hates you, they don't care about what's true. They will just shout out uh, what, what the offense is and what the problem is, and they'll be deceitful about it. And, and the hardest thing, we'll come across again, this one, I'm sure, in Toxic again. The hardest thing about this is that the hardest people to deal with are the deceitful because they constantly move the goalposts. You just feel you've had a rational conversation with that person, and then you subsequently find out that they didn't think it was a good conversation at all, and the goalposts get moved, and you feel like you've been on level ground, but it ends up that you're actually skating on thin ice. Or well, That's a really hard thing for the psalmist to be dealing with. I just want us to know that here we have a man of God experiencing all this stuff, an unfaithful nation, a nation that's turning away from God, deceitful people who are running him down, a sense like, Lord, vindicate me. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you know how that's felt the last couple of years or so, and you, you felt that in increasing measure in our culture. You know how that feels. And the danger is then that we rise up with the, with the same spirit of worldly vindication, and we're even actually further from God. And so this is the beauty of the psalm, that the psalm journeys from just being stuck in this place to finding the joy of the Lord. Let's look at verse 2. You are my God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? And so we're still in that dark place. We're still struggling there. But notice that the psalmist is crying out to God. You are God, my stronghold. Isn't it great to know? that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Isn't it great to know that God is our stronghold? But nonetheless, even while he says this, he's also saying, why have you rejected me? Where have you been, Lord? Lord, where are you? But I suggest this is the where are you of faith. There are some that say, where are you? We go through pain, it didn't work out. We say, where are you? And that becomes our excuse to reject God. You know people like that, and maybe that's been you. You've been tempted through hard times to turn away from the Lord. But I encourage you, have the where are you of faith. Sometimes it's quite valid for the Christian to pray at a prayer meeting or a prayer time. Lord, where are you? We need you to move. Audacious comments, you could, you could say, are used here in this psalm. The Israelites cried out to the Lord from Egypt, and the Lord heard their cry. Amen. The church prayed for Peter. In fact, it was such a miracle. Peter's in prison. They didn't think it was possible in, in one way, but they prayed anyway because they know they should. Lord, we, 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 we pray that you'll, you'll deliver Peter and get him out of jail. There's a knock on the door. Prayer meeting is going on, and it's Peter. The slave girl comes to the door. She goes, hello, hello. And he goes, Pete. He says, hello, I'm Peter. She says, yes, the prayer meeting for Peter is on. Uh, very, very good. And he goes, no, I'm Peter. It's like, yep, we're praying for Peter. And off she goes. She goes back to the prayer meeting, and she says, someone's knocking at the door. And... And, and all the time, Peter was there. God had already answered the prayer. And yet the people, oh, we beseech you, Lord. Lord, I'm going to use all the spiritual language I can possibly use in order for this prayer, to be, which you're probably not going to answer anyway. And so sometimes we pray like that. But hey, friends, is it possible that God can actually answer our prayers? Amen. I mean, let's give him praise. <laughs> Louise and I were talking this week, and we are like... We were thinking to ourselves and, and praying, can we consider that God actually wants to just go way beyond what we've ever seen in a move of God in our land? Um, just imagine as we pray for those who have been, we, we started a new cancer care ministry. As you probably know, at the start of the pandemic, we knew that there would be collateral damage. 
along the way. And there's, there's a lot of people on that list, some in this room right now, who we love very much. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if God healed every single one? Now, we believe in the sovereign will of God. We know his healing comes in many different measures. There comes a time when, unless Jesus comes in our time, that, that your time is up. We understand that. And yet, we've seen God do some great things. Our own family, you've prayed for our, our daughter, to Eleanor, who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. She got healed of Crohn's disease, and the doctor says she doesn't have Crohn's disease. And so we praise God for that. We, you, you prayed for our kids, for Megan Alex. Um, amen. You prayed for that baby after that dreadful wreck they had. And, and little Isaac, he's in church today, and we, he's doing great. And we just praise God for... We've, we've experienced that in our own fellowship. We've seen some wonderful healings in the fellowship. But um, let's just make sure that we are right with God and we ask him to, to move in a mighty way. By the way, that's one reason to, sh to show up at the prayer meeting, amen? Because we need God to do great things in this place and leave those reels alone. Okay? That, that didn't connect with anybody, I don't think. But I, I think you all know what, that, what I'm talking about there. And so we, we cry out to God. And here's the thing. The old, when the Old Testament goes, where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? And the Psalms do a lot of that. God, where are you? And I think that's valid for us to say, Lord, we need you. We need you to move. Pray with some passion, my friend. Pray with some expectation. God, things don't have to stay this way. Lord, we need a, we need a move of God in the land. Well, the New Testament gives the answer. God has sent his son, Jesus. God, what are you doing about it? Let me tell you something. He has sent his son for us. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again three days later. Uh, he, three days later, he rose again and he lives and is among us. I wanna encourage you that Jesus Christ is the answer. We've already got the answer. Jesus is coming back again in his second coming, but can we also believe in his first coming, that God came, Jesus is here, he's with us, and we have the answer. And one of the biggest mistakes the world will do is to attack those who've got the answer. Maybe there's someone in this room and you're kind of, you've become a little bit anti-church. You're a bit anti-God. Um, you, you're kind of the one in the family who's always dragging everybody down. Can I just say the biggest mistake you'll ever make is to run away from God's answer. His name is Jesus Christ and I encourage you to believe in him. And so these agonized cry of verse 1 and verse 2, vindicate me, plead my cause, why have you rejected me? I want to see that we, we move into the answer. And I want us to see, friends, that in an unhealthy culture, it's possible to be very healthy and strong in the Lord. Amen? Because we've already seen that in Daniel. We've seen it in Stephen. We've seen it in Esther. And above all, we see it in our Savior, Jesus, who never even sinned. He, uh, he agonized in Gethsemane. He would even declare on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God answered his cry. He, he had offered up many cries, and God answered each and every one of those cries. Now, I'm gonna, I want to talk about food for a moment, because I know you all like food, right? Um, uh, I, I know my, my sons-in-law, they, they especially like the meat. They've added an extra dimension to our family already. It's like they really like the meat. And what I've learned with our sons-in-law is like there's steak, and there's like really good steak with A1 sauce. Do you know what A1 sauce is? I didn't know what that was, but I do now. And it's like there's a difference between just having steak and having like steak. And when it comes to uh, pulled pork, whatever, when you put it in the green egg, and I know I'm getting, I'm getting you all to salivate already, like, well, the men anyway, which is proof that gender is binary. Just thought I'd throw that one out there. Uh, so so, uh, so uh, obviously, ladies, it's chocolate cake. You know, I'm not stereotyping. I'm not stereotyping. But you all know it's true. And so... And so uh, anyway, so, but there's a difference between like cake and like really good cake, amen? And there's a, there's a difference between steak and, and really good steak. And Louise and I, we, we actually went for dinner and a movie, I think for the first time in about 30 years <laughs> this week. And so we, we, wanted to, we wanted to go see this uh, movie. And actually when we went to see the movie, I uh, went to buy a bottle of water, as we Brits would say, bottle of water. They never understand me, bottle of water. They say, what? What are you talking about? So I go to the theater. We're trying to order a bottle of water. I said, bottle of wa water? What? How do you say it? Water? <laughs> so I tried to say it right. And so the guy goes, um, so what are you going to see? I said, Elvis. He said, oh, it's a good movie. And so he gave me the bottle of water. So I said, thank you very much. Anyway, I thought, <laughs> I thought you'd like that. I thought you'd like that. Anyway, actually, even Louise laughed. She's not laughing right now. But... but <laughs> But it, it, she even laughed then. Anyway, but, but before we went and had this, it was like a really rundown theater. But there was like this really nice Italian restaurant next door. So we had this, um, you know, we sat, sat down for a meal beforehand. 
And uh, the young man who's serving us, Louise ordered pizza. I went for, for pasta. Uh, by the way, I'm the pastor. I ordered pasta, just so I'll tell you that. And so, um, anyway, so Louise has this, this uh, pizza, and, and the waiter says, if you have caramelized onions on this pizza, it will just go to another level. And Louise's like, okay, okay. I'm telling you what, not only was Louise eating the pizza, I was eating the pizza as well because of caramelized onions. You know what I mean? They, I have to say, this place I'll tell you about if you like, the caramelized onions made all the difference. So you can just have food, and then there's another level of food, right? Well, the thing about this, this um, scripture here is that verse 4, when we read about to God my joy and my delight, literally the Hebrew there is, God is my exceeding joy. Now, you and I can have joy, but hear the psalm with an unfaithful nation, with deceitful people, laying it all on the psalmist, making it really hard for them, this miserable culture that he's living in right now. You and I, I think, when you and I go around and we are as miserable as the culture is, because the culture is miserable, therefore I'm a Christian, and I want to be miserable because the culture is so anti-Christian, that's one way of doing it, but the psalmist is like, I don't want this to be laid on me. Lord, I need your vindication. I need to be right with you, and I need this exceeding joy. There's food, and then there's an exceeding level of food, right? And there's joy, and there's exceeding joy, and I believe this is where the Lord would lead us today, that we can leave this place and go to our family groups and minister out of this with actual exceeding joy even in the midst of pain around us. Does that sound like a cool thing? We don't, we don't have to be... We don't have to be grumpy and miserable because the culture is grumpy and miserable. And because the culture is anti-Christian in so many ways, because all the movers and the shakers think that you know, if you just shout loud enough, they, they must be right. And, and, and I get frustrated with that too. But if I land there and I live out of that, I'm going to be as miserable as the world. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we move from, from that place to this place. Let's look at the rest of the word because actually it gets better and better. Let's look at verse three together, shall we? We're coming into the, to the answer to, to all this. Uh, send me your light and your faithful care. Send me your light and your faithful care. Yeah, but, but there's so much propaganda around me. There's so much false philosophy. And yeah, we want to help you with that. There's, there's one thing we're doing for, for parents this, this uh, fall season on a Wednesday night to how to help your kids so that your kid doesn't come home and say something that tells you that they are so far from God. We want to help, help you with that. And I think the answer, though, is found in verse 3. The world is full of propaganda. The world is full of philosophy. There are so many problems about, Lord, send your light. Everyone say that with me. Send your light. We need the light of God in our lives. And here's the thing. Thank you, Brother Corbett. Here's the thing. Jesus is the light. God has already sent his answer. As the Old Testament cried, where are you, Lord? Under the new covenant, we can actually declare Christ is here. Jesus is here. We have Jesus the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Amen. And that world must have looked pretty dark to Jesus as well as he came across demon-possessed people. Selfish people, Pharisees, supposedly the spiritual ones who were themselves far from God. And yet he still says, I am the light. And he beckons us into his light. This world is sin sick. This world is a mess. But I'm thankful that I saw the light. I'm thankful that his light came into my life, that Jesus took hold of me as a 14-year-old kid. I, I, I think I got saved just in time. You all know the story. My dad took his life one month later. So my testimony is I got saved just in time. Just think of all the things I, may have, I, I was spared from. I'm thankful that the light of Jesus came to my life. Are you thankful for the light of Jesus in your life as well? Let's give him praise, shall we? I pray that his light will shine on you today. We read a lot of books this week. Hey, I'm telling you all about what we did last week. Um, we read a lot of books this week, and one of them I read was by Greg Laurie. Give me a wave if you know who that is. Greg Laurie is one of the great evangelists, maybe apart from Billy Graham, or Jay Strack, I think he's preached to more people than any other American in the last 50 years. I think about 9 million people have gone to his crusades. He's a pastor uh, of a church as well in California and in Hawaii as well. His, his second campus in, is in Hawaii. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So mine's in, my other one is in Fayetteville. And, and, Northga <laughs> and, and Northgate. 
uh, as well. So um, anyway, but I re- he, he started writing about Johnny Cash. He's ri- been writing about the Jesus movement, of which he was a big part. And his most recent book is about, it's called Lennon, Dylan, and he mentions some other uh, famous rock musicians. And uh, he's, that's one of his passions, and he chronicles the life of rock musicians and how the light of Christ has actually come into many of their lives. So many of them are not yet the finished article, but there are some incredible testimonies. And so he asked some very interesting questions, but if he first of all talks about the four backsliders, Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, and Carl Perkins, who were known as the Million Dollar Club, and they would get together and they were singing together. They'd all been raised in church, all fell away from the Lord. And you'll have to figure out your own story as to to where they ended up with the Lord. I believe Johnny Cash certainly finished very, very strong. And uh, we actually had a church member at New Hope who was Elvis's stepbrother called Rick Stanley. Give me a wave if any of you remember, remember Rick. He used to testify here. And he, he actually um, saw Elvis, his dead body. Uh, but Elvis had been reading the Bible to him uh, that week. And so I don't know how far back Elvis came to the Lord. He certainly uh, lost touch with himself along the way. But he talks about that. And then he talks about the 27 Club. Do you know who the 27 Club are? At the age of 27, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison... Janis Joplin and Brian Jones all died. And that's the thing about the rock life. They just get into everything so fast that the body is not able to handle it. And, and since, in our time, Kurt Cobain, Amy Whitehouse, same age, 27 years old, died. It's incredible how many died at that particular age. Alice Cooper apparently outpartied all of the 27 Club. And by the way, if you don't know who Alice Cooper is, he was a man. And <laughs> just, just in case you didn't know that, but he was like one of the hardest, rockiest of all, all of those guys. And, uh, but there came a point when his wife said, I'm leaving you. And it seems to be every time the wives said to the husband, if this carries on, I'm leaving you. They didn't want to. And the husband was like so shocked that they, he went into rehab. And actually, the story of Alice Cooper is really, really cool because he's following Jesus. Can we give God praise for that? He's following Jesus. I think he still wears that scary black makeup and everything. And and, but, but he is actually following the Lord, and he's been doing great things. And I just thank God that in any situation, God's light can break into your life. And I want to encourage you, my friend, whatever you're going through, if you're strong in the Lord, if you're weak in the Lord, if you don't know the Lord, I think it's a good thing to go, Lord, send your light. Don't get bitter and angry because the world is bitter and angry. Just say, God, I need your light. And that changes everything. The, the light changed everything for me. Secondly, Can we see in verse 4, grant us grace, Lord. Well, the word grace is not mentioned there, but we read, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy, my exceeding joy. I will praise you with the electric guitar and the uh, Fender Stratocaster. That's just what it says in the Hebrew. Uh, Oh God, my God. But the altar actually is a place where we receive forgiveness and we get right with God and our sins are washed away, and we're made to be clean. That's the place of mercy. What this world needs right now is not more condemnation. The world needs mercy and forgiveness. And you and I, when when we receive his grace, wow, that helps us to be gracious and to start to see others around us. Like, I don't like what that kid does. I don't like that person does. Sure, lead them to the altar. Lead them to the place of amazing grace. What Alice Cooper needed more than anything was not condemnation, but he needed grace. In Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let this be a church of no condemnation, but to open the doors of the kingdom wide open and say, come to Jesus. Lord, send your light. Lord, grant us your grace. Grant us your forgiveness. John Funnell is a young, young pastor. I told you about him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he lives in a place called Abbasuchan. Um, it had the largest ironworks in the world. And when that industry collapsed and everything closed down and the mines closed down, uh, I told you the other day, 75% of the kids in his church are from single parents. The other 25%, they don't have the the original two parents. That's the kind of challenge, the cultural challenge that's all around him. Uh, I know that the total church budget is 32,000 a year. That includes his wage and everything to run the church and run all those ministries. So it gives you an understanding of how committed he is. He does live in the church house right next to right next door to the church building, like 20 yards away. I'm imagining that's not the easiest thing as well. He's got four kids. He's got like three dogs running around. All the friends are coming in. So he's totally sold out for Jesus. And before he got saved, he was into the blues. In fact, he loved a lot of the American blues from some of those famous 
um, blues artists so famous I don't even remember any of their names. But anyway, <laughs> I've exhausted my uh, you know, rock list already. What did Pastor talk about today? Well, and, uh, so I don't want to focus too much on that. But then he came to know Jesus, and this is his testimony that he put out on his blog. Jesus Christ is the life and serenity, purity and peace, the personification of all that is good. He is the embodiment of mercy, the quintessence of sacrificial love and the light in the darkness of this corrupt world. He is the answer, he's the escape, he's the way and the truth and the life, and he's mine. Christianity is not a religion or a philosophy, nor a state of mind. It's not a feeling or a list of laws and principles, nor is it a corporation or a bureaucracy. Christianity is a person, a real person to love and to have a relationship with, a person to share and cast your burdens on, a person who gave his all to save you from yourself and this world, a totally unique, historical, and living person whose love can flow into the most broken vessels such as I, and pour out in such abundance that he can even take hold of you. I pray that you will see the world for what it really is and come to love the one who loved us first. And that was the thing with Alice Cooper and actually many rock stars who've come back to the Lord or come to know the Lord for the first time. They basically tasted everything to excess, more, perhaps more than any of us in this room have ever experienced, and they realized that it's a dead-end street. And it doesn't satisfy. So Lord, send your light. May you and I even come to a point when this world no longer satisfies us. And all we need is Jesus. And I'm telling you, I know that he's all I need. Uh, it's not about our success. It's not about what people think about us. And if they do run us down, that's okay. God may even use that to remind us that the only thing that really matters is our relationship with God. Because do you know why? That's the only thing that really matters. And so finally, I want to give the word to hold out hope. Hold out hope. Look at verse five. Why, my soul, are you downcast? This is a cry. Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Vindicate me, Lord. They said that stuff about me. They're doing that mean stuff in our culture. Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him my Savior, and my God. Billy Graham said, you can live three days without food, but you cannot even live three seconds without hope. And I want to tell you, my friend, we have hope because of Jesus Christ. I've seen the light, and I hope you've seen the light as well. And I just want to thank God that whatever's going on in the culture, whatever someone has been laying upon you, criticizing you, running you down, there are broken relationships, and maybe you're struggling with with your finances right now, you're struggling with your job or your marriage or a relationship. I don't know what it is that you're going through right now, but I do know that when I put my hope in God, when I've got nothing else but hope in Him, He has never disappointed me. In fact, I don't know anyone in this room who would say, I gave my life to Jesus. I've committed my life to Him. I've been giving everything for Jesus Christ. I don't know anyone who's ever done that who's ever been disappointed. I do know a whole lot of people who have run away from Jesus run away from the Word of God, and those things don't satisfy. Can, so can we stand together? And wow, with this full church gathered here today, success is not a full church. I want to say this, success is each and every one of us finding our joy in the Lord, amen? Exceeding joy. There's food and there's like food. There's joy and there's joy in Jesus. There's hope in Him. And so God has called us to do something significant. And I'm going to ask us to pray like we've never prayed before for a move of God in our land. And we'll fi I'm sure we'll figure out, by God's grace, what to do next. Amen. Pastor Ellis, I just want to honor you for your ministry here. Those two years of, of, of craziness in the culture, we're breaking through into great blessing. Hey, can we give it up for Pastor Ellis? We love you so much. And we bless you. Kerry is just phenomenal, and your kids are awesome. And Alex and Meg, we rejoice in you, an incredible student ministry. We've got the baptisms coming up. Baptizing also Rebecca's children as well. Rebecca is our children's minister. We really appreciate you. You are also a wonderful person, and we thank you for all your team, all those volunteers that are technically with you. Stephanie, who's joined the team recently as well, she's incredible as well. So can we give it up for all our, all our ministers here today?
And let's just pray, shall we, as we think about just responding to the Lord and even coming to the altar. And even as I'm praying, if God has touched something, a nerve for you today, you just come and bring that before him right now. But Father God, please show us as a church how we can pray like we've never prayed before. Show us, Lord, how we can put all our hope in Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, when we get angry at the world. Forgive us, Lord, when we spend way too long trying to be vindicated ourselves in the eyes of man. Help us, Lord, to care more than anything else for our relationship with you. So, you know, just prayerfully right now, you might just come forward and bring your request. If there's a, a prayer request in your heart that's not yet being done, and you just, you're praying for that child, you're praying for that situation, you're praying for that health situation, even just right now, you just come forward. And, you know, we won't even, we won't even sing right now. I'm just going to give that opportunity. If you, you just need to bring a request to the Lord, bring it right now, amen, and just lift it up before him. Do you remember when Elisha was... Um, uh, gave instructions to the widow. He said, don't just bring a few jars, bring a whole load of jars. And I want to encourage you, don't just pray a few things, pray a whole load of things. As you come forward now, may God bless you. May he hear your prayer. May he answer your prayer. I thank God for the prayers he's answered in my life, in our family's life, in our church's life. And Father God, I want to bring some requests to you right now. I'm going to ask for your great blessing upon the South Campus for our family group leaders, Lord, for the children's leaders, for all the ministry we've got lined up. Perhaps, Lord, for one of the great seasons in our church's history, we pray, Lord, you will bless us. And Lord, then help us not to just be in the place of comfort and wanting everything just to be just so. We pray, Lord, this will be a church crucified with Christ, sold out for God, looking all out for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all our young people. We pray they will see a church on fire. May they be able to flourish and grow, Lord. God, we thank you for our North Campus since Easter time. We thank you for the growth that's been there at the North Campus. Bless Al Mead, Lord, and his leadership there. We pray, Father, we'll continue to see movement forward. Thank you that Mike Stewart is leading the, the student ministry, and already we're seeing an uptick there. Lord, we pray that that will just continue. Bless Zeke, Father God. Thank you for his incredible leadership, developing others, not wanting to be the star of the show, but to, to bless others along the way. And we pray, Lord, that you'll use him. Bless him, Father, as we have... Um, additions to our team in these days. And Lord, we pray for Northgate, Lord, on this uh, a time of transition for Northgate, Father God, as Rich Terry, Lord, is, is our interim uh, campus pastor there for the time being. We pray you'll use him. And Lord, as this community goes, Lord, what do you want us to do? We pray, Lord, that you'll bless us. Uh, you told us to do this, Father God, in the strangest of times, but we pray you'll bless the North Campus, uh, Northgate campus in a supernatural way. Everyone say amen to that. And I just want to say one more thing. It's really important that every one of us is right with the Lord. Amen. I always pray this will be a church that if you come to worship and you're not right with God, I pray this will be a place where you will always be uncomfortable with that until you get right with God. Amen. I pray that will be the case. Don't let, ever let that stop you coming here, but make sure that if you come in that way, that you leave different. Amen. So I just want to pray a prayer that we're all get, we all get right with him. And you might be praying this for the first time. You may be praying this as a recommitment or just as some regular maintenance. Amen. So just pray this with me, everyone. Let's bow our heads in prayer. You can even repeat it out loud back to me. Why don't the whole church do this right now? Just pray this with me. Dear Lord, I want to be right with you. Help me, Lord, to worry less about what people think of me. Help me to be concerned more about what you think of me. Lord, I've sinned against you. Lord, I need you. So please send your light. Thank you that Jesus is the light. Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Convict me of sin. Convince me of Jesus. And if you pray that prayer, Put your hands in the air right now. If you, if you just prayed that, that's awesome. Just to acknowledge him, that's a good thing, isn't it? And if that was for you a first time, I'd love you to go to our next steps desk uh, just after the service. Just say, hey, you know, I prayed that prayer that Pastor Reese prayed. I think we've got some gifts out of this that we like to give away as well. And as you see this baptism, these baptisms take place, you may just go yourself, wow. I need to do that as well. Make sure you tell one of our ministers or one of your family group leaders that, hey, it's time for you to be baptized as well. Hey, uh, we're going to have baptisms now. Let's praise God, shall we, everybody?